Well, hi, uh, and uh, welcome to uh, another Paul preaching. I'm hoping that I won't go quite as long as the Apostle did this morning, uh, but if you're sitting near a window, I'm just advising caution. Uh, how about we uh, pray and come to God? Uh, Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning, and we pray that as we think through 2 Corinthians 7 together, uh, you might stir our hearts, uh, warm our affections, and remind us of your goodness. Uh, Father, help us to cling to you as you cling to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. But we live in a world, don't we, where the invitation that we're making to people as we preach the gospel is actually quite a radical and even a risky invitation. God's truth is liberating and life-changing, but it's also actually scary and difficult. And when you think about it, coming to Jesus means saying to him, you've got control of my whole existence. Uh, and that means for all sorts of people, different things. It could mean the possibility of losing uh, respect of rela or relationship with your family. Uh, it might mean choosing to stay single and feeling the loss of companionship of a special person. Uh, it might involve being willing to be wronged rather than standing on your rights. To come to Christ might mean giving up your anger as a way of controlling your anxiety. For all of us, because we're sinful, coming to Jesus actually requires repentance, which means letting go of things. And the potential for the sense of loss there is very, very great. See, if someone comes to you and says, I've got the truth for you from God, and all you need to do is give up all of your life and turn and live in this totally new way, what does that feel like? And the answer is, for many people, it feels like an enormous risk. It feels like getting, letting go of what is certain and real and regular and grasping onto something that you're not quite certain about. So what kind of relationship is involved? What trust is involved with the person who brings you a message like this if you're going to place your life in the hands of the God who speaks this message to you? Well, friends, that's actually, in, in many ways, the situation between Paul and the Corinthians. Paul's brought them a message saying, give up everything else and turn to Jesus. And they have done that. But over time, their relationship with Paul has become strained. There's been disagreement. There's been stress. And there's a whole bunch of questions. Did he believe what he preached? Did the message that he bring really represent the message that came from God? And Paul is in a fight in 2 Corinthians to encourage them to persist with the gospel that he brought them so that they might actually stay in relationship with the living God. And the question at the heart of actually all these chapters in the middle of 2 Corinthians is, what would it take for them to trust Paul and so to trust God? Uh, and my prayer is that as we see Paul again speak about the foundations of his ministry and why his ministry can be trusted, um, we will actually see that this is a precious and real ministry that gripped the messenger of this message as much as he wants it to grip us. So in this section, we actually see three things about Paul and his relationship with the Corinthians, I think. And we see that Paul is a man who cares deeply. We see that Paul is a man who understands the significance of what he calls on them to do when he invites them to repentance. And we see that Paul is a man who knows that they need to be encouraged in their faith in spite of the difficulty. Now, this letter, as we've seen already, is one of the most emotional letters in the entire New Testament. It drips with pathos. Um, these people weren't a notch on Paul's evangelistic belt. They weren't a statistic or a win or a number in a book somewhere. They were people that he loved deeply and cared for. And as you pick, up, you pick it up in this chapter, you see these short clipped sentences and Paul is falling over himself to hold on to the different emotions and struggles. Listen to it, verse 2. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I don't say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. There's this kind of outflow of sentences and emotions and words as all of Paul's feelings for the Corinthians pour out. He, he kind of wants to uh, encourage them. He wants to defend himself. We haven't wronged anyone or corrupted anyone, but he doesn't want them to feel wronged or to misunderstand his communication. So I don't say this to condemn you. Uh, there's this kind of jumble. You can almost feel the apostle's anguish as he writes these words. What, what I find really interesting in this space is in the middle of Paul's anguish, it's still deeply Christian. Uh, do you notice that little phrase there in verse 3, to die together and to live together? Now, isn't that interesting? We would say um, our hearts are together to live and to die together. 
Um, because for us, the logic is you live and then you die. But Paul's worldview has actually been transformed by the gospel and his logic is Christian, even in the depths of his anguish. He hasn't called on them to live and die with him, but he's actually called on the Corinthians to die with him in Christ and then to live the new life that's in the gospel. And so even this little turn of phrase um, reveals how much the, the, the truth of the gospel is impacting Paul as he wrestles with them. Um, but this emotional outpouring continues in the following verses. Verse 5, even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, to understand these verses, you actually kind of need to remember kind of 2 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3, which were actually about three years ago in this series. So I'm not expecting you to have been there or to remember them. Um, but from the beginning of Corinthians, in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing to them because he'd made a promise. He said, I'm going to visit you on my way to going to Macedonia. But in the end, Paul actually bypassed them and went to Macedonia and he sent Titus to them with a letter. And it was quite a serious letter. Uh, most probably there was a member of their congregation that had committed some very serious sin and probably against Paul. And Paul didn't want to turn up um, himself and make the situation worse. So he sent Titus with a letter to them. But ever since he sent Titus on his way to them uh, to plead with them to deal with this sin in their midst, he's been deeply anxious for the outcome. And actually, Paul's joy in this letter is deeply tied to his knowledge of how the Corinthians are going in the faith. Back in chapter 2, Paul says, I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ. And even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, in other words, God opened a way for him to speak about Jesus. He says, my spirit was not at rest because I didn't find Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. And Paul couldn't even find the, the peace to preach the gospel because he was so worried about what was going on for the Corinthians. And then we read here in verses five and six, when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. All of the opening verses of this chapter reveal Paul's deep love for the Corinthians and the fact that his heart and joy and hope is tied up with them and their progress in the gospel. For Paul's ongoing defense to the Corinthians involves this truth. I loved you so much that you actually consume my life and my thoughts because for Paul, this message, the truth about God and people's eternal salvation gripped him at every moment and they actually lay in the very heart of his life. Now, what is it that happens when Paul receives this message back from Titus about what's happened? Well, what he hears is that they've done this incredibly difficult thing of repenting and engaging with this really messy pastoral situation that he'd written the letter about. But notice how Paul engages with that in verse seven, sorry, verse eight. Even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a little while, as it is I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Paul, who has been longing to hear of their response, has Titus come back to him and tell him, yes, actually the Corinthians read your letter and they realised that this man had sinned and they've called him to account and they've acted in, in huge ways actually to, to bring about his repentance and his change. But do you notice that as Paul engages with them over the truth of this, do you notice how thoughtful he is about the process that's involved? Um, he realises that calling on them to repent in this matter involved pain and anguish at all sorts of levels. See, do you notice that Paul himself has to draw, juggle this line between being grieved and not grieved? Um, what in fact was going on was that he knew for their sake that their obedience to Jesus mattered so much that their salvation hinged on it. And so he longed for them to repent and he knew that if they didn't repent, there was ultimate reality involved. And so Paul says, 
I was willing to cause you grief. But I want you to know that I, that that wasn't my plan. It's not what I rejoiced in. In fact, I know it was hard for you. And Paul goes to great lengths here, really, to unpack the fact that he knew that he was in pain and he knew that they were in pain as he called on them to treat Jesus as Lord. His compassion and wisdom and generosity in this space was that he didn't just say, oh, look, Jesus is on the throne. You need to sort it out and suck it up. What he actually said was to treat Jesus as king is going to be uncomfortable and difficult. And I have regretted having to cause you pain, but... I want you to know that I would do it again in a sense because this kind of pain is the kind of pain that is for your good. And Paul, as he recounts to them what happened in this space, is willing to acknowledge his own pain and their own pain, even as he wants them to know that that pain wasn't the ultimate goal and that they have actually received something more valuable than that pain. And so do you notice that Paul, in his pastoral wisdom, moves on to deep encouragement of them in light of the discomfort that they have been through to make Jesus Lord. Verse 17, verse 13. We are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by all, you all. For whatever boasts I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But as everything we said to you is true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. And I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Now, I want you just to reflect for a moment on the cost of those words for the Apostle Paul and of the significance of them. I mean, think back through the Corinthian letters, that sexual immorality, complete misunderstanding of the return of Jesus, uh, backbiting, fighting, divisions, envy. Uh, and this letter, which is full of the Corinthians sitting on a knife edge between following the super apostles or coming back and listening to Paul and his gospel, if you had faced all of that in relationship with people, what do you think you might be tempted to do? Um, I know I would be tempted to grumbling, to whining, to complaining, to justifying, to anger, to all sorts of things. But do you notice that Paul, even in the midst of the discomfort, speaks so encouragingly to them? My boasting about Titus has proved to be true. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Um, do you hear that Paul wants the Corinthians to know that even as he has called on them to make this hard choice to place Jesus as king and to repent and to deal with a difficult situation, he's actually encouraging them and warmly telling them that they have done the right thing. He's supporting them and helping them to see that the decisions that they have made in Christ were good decisions for them. And so, brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of the section, there are two quick things that I want to invite you to think about in terms of application. Uh, the first is that in this section, as Paul is wrestling with the Corinthians and inviting them to take the Lordship of Jesus seriously, do you notice how much he encourages them and comforts them that the cost of what they have lost is not comparing to the gain that they have received in Jesus. And if you want to reflect on any verse in this section, can I just suggest verse 9 to you? As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. They had to give up all sorts of things. They had to take relational risks in bringing this man uh, to punishment, potentially, for his wrongdoing. Uh, there were many things that they could have held on to as a loss, but Paul wants to say, do you know what? Ultimately, honouring Jesus as king, whatever it is that you have given up for the sake of Christ, it is not a loss, for godly grief brings salvation without regret. And so, brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you this morning, are you finding following Jesus sometimes lonely or tiring or frustrating or even daunting? Um, are there costs that God is asking you to incur that you feel like are too much for you to bear? Do you need to be encouraged this morning to remember that having Jesus as Lord, even though he calls on you to give things up, 
that is not for your loss, but for your gain. Jesus gave up his life for you and is offering you the kingdom. And whatever it is that he asks us to let go of for him, it is as nothing compared to what we receive in the forgiveness and salvation in Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, keep going. Keep holding on to Christ. Keep repenting. Keep being willing to give up whatever it is that you need to give up to have him as king. But I want to encourage you to, um, for many of you, your role is not just as followers of Jesus, but as messengers of this truth to other people. Uh, and I want you to be reminded and encouraged this morning about the depth of Paul's relationship with the people that he pastored and of his deep love for them because of the gospel. And I just wonder as you think about that, um, whether at the moment you can think of people in your ministry that you know of who need to be encouraged about what they have gained in spite of the difficulty of what they have lost. Are there people that you need to tell that you've seen them make hard decisions for Jesus? Do you need to tell people that you've seen some of what they have lost or the cost of some of their decisions to follow Christ and how encouraged you are and how you rejoice with them in the decisions that they've made? Paul reminds us here that even in the ministry of rebuking and challenging people with the gospel, our people need deep encouragement to let go of sin and to keep following Jesus. Paul didn't preach the truth of Jesus to these people in a vacuum. He believed what he preached and it flowed out in everything about his relationship with them. And my prayer, brothers and sisters, is that it would we would so grasp the riches of what we have in Jesus that it would flow out of our lives in our relationship with those that we minister the gospel to as we preach to ourselves and remind ourselves to give up something for the Lordship of Jesus is to suffer no loss because godly grief produces salvation without regret. Amen.